Well, thank you very much for um, that kind introduction and, and thank you for inviting me to talk to you um, this evening. Um, those of you who, who may be familiar with my work at all, obviously Roman camps are very much my first love when it comes to the Roman army in Scotland. I also do um, quite a lot of work on the Antonine Wall um, as well, but I'm going to talk principally about camps tonight, which are um, I were until relatively recently one of the lesser studied uh, types of Roman sites that you get in Scotland. So I have changed my I've structured my talk into sort of five parts. So firstly, um, I'll explain what I mean when I'm talking about a camp because I don't mean a Roman fort, which is a different thing. Um, the history of archaeological research and why we've got such a strong history um, in Scotland, which has given us a really strong body of evidence, their survival and distribution, which is sort of really what we know, what form they take, what it is that makes us um, confident that these things are camp, are camps, and then I'll finish off talking about um, their context and potential dating. So the first section I'm going to explain what a camp is. We get, in essence, four different types of camps, or we've interpreted them in four different ways. We get marching camps, so that's troops on the march, construction camps, siege camps and practice camps. I will run through um, all four of these categories, but you may have seen of my opening slide, um, I subtitled this talk on the march because the majority of camps in Scotland are indeed marching camps, which we would interpret as enclosures which house troops which are temporarily away from their base, um, often on campaign but also on policing activities. So if I start with construction or labour camps, the most obvious examples of these um, lie along the Antonine Wall and this isn't the normal image that you would see of the Antonine Wall because everyone always focuses understandably on the forts along the wall but there are a selection of camps along the wall which you can see highlighted here um, and named. Um, you'll see that there are obviously some various gaps there. And these are of a similar size and shape. Um, they're quite close to the wall. A couple of them have been dated, produced dating evidence suggesting um, early Antonine. And we're relatively confident that these house the troops that were involved in the construction of the wall. Um, another type of construction camp um, that, we, that we're quite confident is so is this site at Steed Stalls in Perthshire, which is actually not very far from the fortress of Inch Toothill. And I don't know if you, how well you can see, but you've got these peculiar looking tadpole shape crop marks um, coming up through the um, differential growth of, growth of the crop. And then these earthwork features you can see now, these haven't been excavated, but we think the most likely explanation for them is that they're Roman lime kilns and that these were used by the army who were constructing uh, the nearby fortress of Inch Toothill. And indeed, this is actually an image of a lime kiln um, that I took from the continent a few years ago just to, to start giving us an idea. I mean, this is a particularly large one to give us an idea of what these things may have looked like. Back to the Antonine Wall ones, the, all the ones on the Antonine Wall are known only as crop marks, so you can't see them generally on the ground. You can see them in a dry summer because the grass grows differently over the buried ditches. And so on the right hand side, we've got the camp at Tamfer Hill, which actually looks a little different now because the extension of the um, of the canal at the Falkirk Wheel actually comes uh, comes quite close to the camp. But on the left, you can see a plan of all the different camps along the wall. And I hope you'll see that there's actually quite a lot of similarities. There are a whole group that are a very similar size and shape. We've got a handful where we've only got bits of them, so we have to guess. And then on the bottom row, we've got four slightly larger ones, uh, which are possibly early in the construction sequence for the wall. Siege camps. Um, that's another, um, another major type that you get, particularly in, in Europe and in the Near East. Um, the most celebrated examples in Europe are probably around the Iron Age fortress of Numantia um, in northern Spain. But on the left here, I've also got the siege ramp from the, um, from the selection of camps that around the fort at Machairus in Jordan. And to give you an idea of scale, that's actually a person standing, unfortunately, yellow in a yellow T-shirt um, on this desert background. Um, and that's so these are both di different types of siege where the Roman army are besieging um, a local hill fort of some description. And the closest we have to siege camps in Scotland are the two camps on either side of the hill at Burnswalk, which have been variously claimed as being practice works of the Roman army 
or a genuine siege. And recent work by the Tremontium Trust, together with the Dumfries and Galloway archaeologist, has started to suggest that perhaps they were indeed used for a siege, but it's still very hotly debated. Practice camps, these are particularly prevalent in areas in upland Wales and all the examples here in Wales. The bottom left, um, you probably can't see it too well, but there are five little square things. These are, this is in Snowdonia. Um, in northern Wales and we've got quite a handful of them that are a short march away from a fort where it's quite obvious that they're practicing corners, building camps. You can see by the small one I've got in the top left known as Brachthi that actually the, it's got these large internal ways standing as, as earthworks and you couldn't pitch a uh, a Roman temp in the interior of this. It, it's not there for, for occupation, it's there for practice. And on the right hand side, we've got Clanderinded Common, just south of, uh, of Clanderinded Wells, where there's 21 camps now known um, to the south of the fort there. And that's really showing that this is really quite a Salisbury Plain type practice area for the Roman army. And we've got classical sources. I've got examples here from Vegetius and Josephus, two, uh, two Roman authors from, from different centuries. Um, and the first one from Vegetius, you will see that they refer to a walled city being carried around, which is quite a good example. And then also from Josephus, they invade hostile territory. They refuse battle until they fortified their camp. It's all about constructing the camp. But interestingly, he makes this remark, they fire the camp. Josephus was writing about um, the, um, the Roman army in the first century AD in, um, in the Near East, in modern day, in sort of Judea. It's the, it's the uh, Bellum Judaicum, the Battle of Judea or the, or the Ju Judean War. So it, he's talking about a slightly different context, but there is a presumption that they destroyed sites. But you will see from the evidence and the survival that we've got that they obviously didn't always um, destroy sites. They may have destroyed aspects of sites, but perimeter defences are often what's left. And I'll show you more of that shortly. We've also got things like Trajan's Column, which described Trajan's wars in Dacia in modern day Romania, where he shows the soldiers actually on all the campaigns and all aspects of it, including camp building, and you can see they're building one here. And then here we've got a nice um, illustration of, you can sort of see the walls, um, which are possibly turf or brick. And then inside that you can see camp, you can see tents, and then you can see standards, and then you've got a whole series of, of army activity roundabout. So we have got sources like this um, as well. Now, I'm talking about soldiers that are moving. I'm talking about temporary things. I'm not talking about forts here that have got um, timber or stone constructed buildings that are intended for more permanent occupation. These are things that are intended for occupation for potentially a matter of weeks or in the case of practice camps, they're not occupied at all. They're practicing construction techniques. And to give you an idea of scale, these two are to scale. Um, the one on the left is St. Leonard's in the Scottish Borders, which is the largest camp in anywhere in Europe. There are some slightly larger ones now known in Syria. And the one on the right is the smallest one um, in Britain, which is Clint Hall for in Snowdonia, which you barely see if I hadn't used a really thick pen to draw it with. So that gives you an idea of I'm talking about things that are vastly different and we're lumping them all into this category. But I will be, because I'm talking about the, the ones in Scotland, are predominantly talking about marching camps. In terms of where we get them, well, here's a map of the Roman Empire, and we do get them the length and breadth of the Roman Empire. Perhaps not surprisingly, we get them, they're better known in places which have had a long history of recording sites. Um, but for example, when they started doing aerial survey in the Czech Republic and Slovakia from the early 90s after the fall of the Iron Curtain, they've discovered a huge number of camps. And in fact, that's probably the, the, one of the best comparanda to what we have in Scotland because they've got, they've got camps beyond the frontier in the way that we do beyond both Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall here. And indeed, they've got camps now only 20 miles from the Polish border. So we're talking quite a long way um, into the Czech Republic. There's quite a number known in Romania. There's some known um, in Syria and Egypt um, and other parts of the Roman Empire. Most recently, there's been a program of looking at um, of laser scanning from the air, LIDAR survey 
um, in northwestern Spain, and they're having an absolute explosion of uh, of the numbers they've done. They've just published 66 new camps just in northwest Spain alone. So it is an area that's actually growing across the continent, which is really exciting to see. So that takes me on to the history of archaeological research, which in many ways is why we are perhaps ahead of some of our uh, European colleagues with regards to recording and publishing these things because we have been recording them for so long. And that is in part due to the interest of antiquarians um, and a long history of research. One of the key figures in the 18th century was General Robert Melville. It's perhaps not surprising that it's military men who are um, going across Scotland. Now, Robert Melville, one summer in 1754, got on his horse and discovered four Roman camps within, within less than a week. Um, and that's the kind of hit rate that you didn't get from anybody until we started um, going up in an aeroplane in the 20th century. But he um, passed on that information to William Roy, who was engaged in, um, in surveying and mapping Scotland. Um, some of you may be familiar with Roy's great map of Scotland. And Roy did meticulous maps of these, um, which is quite fitting for the man that, that agitated to the extent that he led to the foundation of the Ordnance Survey, which was ultimately founded three years after his death. And indeed here, um, I hope you can see the quality of these illustrations. These are by William Roy of those camps that Robert Melville discovered in 1754. They were planned by Roy in 1755. And indeed they're planned as earthworks here, whereas in the case of, uh, of, of several of them, part of them have been ploughed out in the remaining 250 years and they look quite different today, although we have actually got differential crop marks, as I say, the crops grow differently over buried ditches. Um, but these really are very high quality maps indeed, particularly for their time. And as I say, in the 20th century, it was um, the advent of aerial survey that really has brought on our understanding of the distribution of these in leaps and bounds. And the pie chart on the right just shows how they've been discovered. And you'll see from that that 82% of all camps now known in Scotland were discovered from the air. So that's a vast number. Um, so it shows the explosion that we've had in the 20th century, um, less so in the 21st century. Um, there's other things. Now, one of the reasons for having this explosion of interest is the three key people who set up, who started flying in Scotland, were all very interested in the Roman army. On the left, I've got OGS Crawford, who is the first archaeological officer for the Ordnance Survey um, in 1920. And he did his first flight over Scotland in 1930, didn't actually take a camera with him, but then flew again, not until 1939. It was years later when he did take a camera. And he actually quite freely admitted when he wrote it up that there was so much that he could see, so much in terms of differential crop marks, that he focused on the Roman sites, uh, which is great for somebody like me. Um, next to him, we have prof the late Professor St. Joseph from Cambridge University, um, who really started flying in earnest from the 1940s onwards and spent every summer um, doing a huge amount of reconnaissance in Scotland based from Cambridge. So these are long range flights. He did cover um, other parts of the world and other parts of Britain, but he obviously had a had a, um, a deep interest in the campaigns of the Roman army north of Hadrian's Wall. And then the bottom right, we've got Gordon Maxwell, who used to be head of archaeology at the Royal Commission. And he set up a Scotland-based flying programme in 1976, which is still operational today. Indeed, the very first camp that um, Crawford photographed in 1939 is this site at Gallibury. This isn't his actual photograph because the photograph itself hasn't actually, um, isn't actually a very high quality, but this was that first camp discovered in Dumfries and Galloway um, by Crawford in 39. So this is actually the distribution. This is what it's left us with. Um, I've taken it down to, to Hadrian's Wall to give you an idea of the scale and, and you will immediately see the lines and the patterning that there, that there is and these things lying along Roman roads, but also outliers and some of the gaps, particularly in southwestern Scotland, these are places where we know we're missing sites. And in terms of their discovery, um, 
I say this this graph only goes up to 2010, but had I added on the the last decade, uh, it wouldn't look any different um, from the 2000s. So you'll see there's been an absolute explosion in recording from the 40s onwards. And really, if we want to find new camps now, it's other techniques that we need to to do because they'll be in pasture areas or areas where which are not obviously responsive to crop markings. Um, and with the more rainfall we're getting, it's harder to get crop marks as well. But that gives you an idea of this huge spike in discovery that happened from the air um, in the sort of middle to, to late part of the 20th century. Now, St. Joseph did spent every September after the, the summer flying season had finished sticking trenches through camps. Now, this map is a map of uh, every red dot is a camp in northeastern Scotland and every little cross is one that St. Joseph put a trench through. So I think you'll agree that he was incredibly busy. I mean, this is a programme of over 40 years worth of excavations doing really small scale trenches. The photograph there is one of these small trenches that he did really to just check that he was correct when he was saying, I think I'm finding a, a Roman camp. And in fact, it's because of this programme of excavation that he did that actually made us, has given us the confidence today of, of, of knowing what is definitely a camp as opposed to what is without necessarily having to put a, a spade in the ground. Interestingly, one site he didn't put a hole through uh, is the site of Kintor in Aberdeenshire, which was then subject to a succession of um, excavations, really large scale excavations um, in the early 2000s. Initially, it was the um, duelling of the A96 in the area and then lots of housing estates in the because it's in the commuter belt for Aberdeen. And these excavations have actually given us a wealth of information about the interior of a camp. It's by far the largest scale that's told us the most. And um, here's one of the publications from that. And they got 180 odd ovens, lots of rubbish pits and lots of information that actually starts to tell us about how the Romans used the space within the camps. Uh, and because obviously there, there were a hive of activity inside, but because they're only occupying them for a few weeks, what tends to survive or what we tend to see um, are the big earthwork features, the big perimeter defences. So that takes me on to survival and distribution. Well, I've shown you one distribution map already. We do have um, quite a number that do survive as earthwork features in the landscape. This is Pennymuir in the Scottish borders, very close to the border with, with England. And if I were to stand in the ditch of the camp here. You, the camp's been reused. If you're wondering what you can see here, you're getting a, a reuse of, of a camp to, in a second phase. But if I were to stand in the ditch, the top of the rampart would be above the top of my head. It's about two metres um, from top to bottom. So this survives as a substantial earthwork feature. So although some have been ploughed out in the intervening sort of 1900, 2000 years, um, there are a lot that haven't, and it really depends on, on the land use um, of the last couple of millennia. Forestry, quite a number survive in forestry, and here's an example here that, that gives you, and, and these are again, um, this is one of the sites that was discovered by Melville in 1754, and only part of it survives in upland, uh, sorry, in, in the, as an upland structure in the woodland here, but it gives you an idea of, of the scale of, of these things. Um, again, this is one of the other ones that was planned by Roy, discovered by Melville and has now been ploughed out. And you can see the crop mark of this is Battle Dyke's Oathlaw, and you can see the crop mark of the ditch coming around here. This is a huge camp. And then we have the um, well-known site of the Fortress of Inch Toothill in Perthshire, which also has um, a very well recorded camp outside it. There's the camp. And indeed, that's the Fortress of Inch Toothill, which was subject to some excavations in the 60s. And if I go back to that camp and we look at it in detail, I hope you can actually see, as well as the perimeter of the camp coming around here, there are these rows upon rows of pits. And indeed, some of the pits just here were excavated and shown to be rubbish pits. So we've probably got a, a lot of the ones that are in these double rows that we can see are probably rows of, of rubbish pits at the edge of tents. So we've got to imagine rows of tent lines here. And when you get this richness in the crop mark record that can actually start to, to indicate really the layout of, of, 
of the Roman army, we can start to actually imagine what the interior of these would have looked like and how they might have utilized the space. Some of the, the ones that dot, are dotted around the inside of the, of the, the perimeter, just inside the ditch around the outside, um, are possibly ovens that are tucked into the back of the rampart, but Kintour demonstrated that ovens could be anywhere in the camp because they were scattered around the camp. So it's a mix of things that we can interpret these as. So in terms of their distribution, they are, uh, we've actually got more in Scotland than they have in England and Wales put together, and Wales is dominated by practice camps, um, but that's possibly not because they weren't they weren't constructed, it's just perhaps that we they by the time they were in the north and by the time we're in the late first century, they were probably routinely putting a ditch round a camp, which they may well not have been earlier, because the most important thing we're told by the classical authors is to build a rampart, is to build that wall. And of course, once that's destroyed by the plough or whatever, or some form of construction or later land use, that's very difficult to necessarily ascertain where it was, whereas a ditch will get filled in but it will leave a mark archaeologically. So that's possibly one reason why we, why we are seeing the difference, although there, has, um, there have been one or two that are coming up in, in um, southeast England. More recently, through major road schemes, they found things like um, the, the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and things like that. So this is the distribution in Scotland. Again, um, I've shown you this map earlier, but again, along these marching routes and Roman roads. So that takes me to what they looked like and how we can be confident and comfortable that we're talking about camps here. Well, the classical authors describe them in a particular way. Um, they're square or rectangular routinely, although not always. They have particular types of gates. They're laid out in a particular way. Um, and so in, in a very similar way to Roman forts. And indeed, they would have used this sort of surveying equipment known as a groma, which was also used in sort of uh, town planning layout at Roma Fort layout and, and, uh, and that kind of construction, which helps people to actually look down and, and sight themselves so you could actually sight from one side of the camp to another. In terms of their defences, uh, we believe that they would have used some form of potential timber breastwork. There's different ways of interpreting that. We don't have the archaeological evidence to know exactly how. This was the um, site of Archaeolink in Aberdeenshire where they did a reconstruction and they lashed the, these are the valley, the stakes that the Roman soldiers carried when they were um, when they were moving around, these are, their, these are part of their weaponry. Um, and they've got three of them lashed together in the form of a caltrops to provide this sort of barbed wire effect. And that is possibly one way that they could have been used for defense. And here's another um, example of a reconstruction that's at the site of Carnuntum in Austria. And I've always liked this one because there's an entrance to, the, to a camp. Um, they've put them as, as stakes in a sort of form of palisade on top, but there's a display board and a rubbish bin on the way in, which all camps ought to have really. Gates. Um, sometimes we just get a gap, but more often than not, we get some form of additional entrance because an entrance obviously is a weak point and you have fortified the camp for strength. So if you've got a weak point, you need to protect that. And we have these curvy um, entrances, which we call claviculi, which actually um, force the army to walk in in a certain way, effectively exposing your unshielded side on the way in. Um, the, the most common one is the third one here, the, the, the titulus or titulum, which is an additional piece of rampart and ditch outside the fort, uh, outside the camp, which obviously means that you couldn't charge it, you would have to go around. And they're all variants on a theme, but they're all actually basically stopping you um, from going straight into the camp. And here's an example um, of a titulus. This is the site of grassy walls not far from Perth. Um, this is a particularly large camp and sometimes when you've got changes of direction, they'll change direction to gate. It's all part of the way that they did the camp, the camp layout and they've actually um, considered what space they need inside uh, for the size of the army and what the army's carrying with it. Um, this is one of my favourite ones, Ward Law, um, down in Dumfries and Galloway, where actually you've got four titulae outside one gate, which is either a camp commander gone mad. You can almost imagine, no, it's in the wrong place, have another go. But actually, um, it's possible that there's an element of practice going on here. But we also think this camp has probably been used more than once because you will see on the left hand side, you will see another one of these um, titulae, these, these traverse um, protective things, but there is no gap 
in the ditch visible. So it's possible there's two phases of use, one when the gate was, was an open gate and the other when it wasn't used and so the ditch was then cut across. Um, here's another example where actually the ditch of, uh, of this camp here is then utilised for what we think is a later roadway. We think we've got some um, evidence for early medieval and field layout um, after the Romans were here. So that helps to confuse the picture. This is Castle Dykes near Lanark. Um, and here we have the fort of, um, at Dalgan Ross um, near Comrie in, in Perthshire, which has these wonderful external um, clavicular, it's got a clavicular and an oblique traverse coming out to create this um, sort of peculiar entranceway. These are known, um, this particular arrangement is known only in Scotland. Um, they're called stracathrotype because they were first formally recognised by St Joseph at the site of Stracathro in Angus, but in actual fact they were planned by Roy at this site of Dalgin Ross um, a couple of centuries earlier, but um, we're not going to start trying to get everybody to change to start calling them Dalgan Ross types. So there's the gates um, clearly visible there. Um, those particular ones, uh, these, the, or the, rather the claviculi that you get, um, are recorded more sparsely, and we've got some. We we think that we're relatively confident on the dating of those from here and indeed on the continent. Um, and as you can see here, it is a sparse distribution. It's not the most common form of gate. Um, and that particular type of stracathrotype that I mentioned is, uh, is only recorded. And these are the instances where it's recorded in Scotland. So a couple of them, you can see that they're almost in pairs, potentially a day's march apart. So again, we're probably missing some. And it's possible that actually there was a particular camp prefect, some kind of camp commander who was responsible for the layout of the fort or of the camp, um, who particularly liked this type of gateway. So it may be almost that we're seeing the work of one individual who's moving with the army in different sized groups. And I'll come on to sizes shortly, but that's, a, that's one explanation. Um, I'm not saying it's the explanation, but it is an explanation uh, for why we have these peculiar ones. Fortunately, about 15 years ago, because they have all been known as only as crop marks, we actually discovered an upstanding one. Um, this is Rabenfoot, um, under where I've written form. Um, there's the Roman fort of Rabenfoot um, in Esdale Muir. And, um, and you'll be able to see down the middle a long linear thing, which is a, a Neolithic bank barrow but um, which, would, which had been known for years. But what had everyone, everyone had generally missed was the fact that there are all these linears around it. And in fact, there's the bank barrow and there, it does indeed have a Roman marching camp sat on top of it with these um, strac stracathrotype gates um, pointing to them. Then one of which actually uses the bank barrow. For those of you that know Estelle Muir, you'll know that it's, it's one of the areas of Scotland with highest precipitation. Um, and so the bank barrow does actually provide um, a high point and, uh, and a dry point for the entrance. Um, and this, when we mapped it, this is what it, it looks like. So we've got a decent sized camp here with these entrances. And in the bottom right, um, we've got an internal clavicular because we always suspected that they would have had internal claviculars as well. But because they're all known as crop marks, internal clavicular usually are just mounds, these semicircles that come inside, they're mounds without ditches. So again, if it's ploughed out, we don't see the remains of those. And um, and this is the one that's on the bank barrow. So the, the line going down the middle is, is the bank barrow and you can see um, the ditch of the traverse and the clavicular there. This is what one of them looks like on the ground. It's a very subtle feature. Um, and that's what that looks like. And we've actually, uh, we've done digital terrain modeling and then we've exaggerated by a factor of times three to actually get the detail here because it is such a subtle earthwork feature, which is why it had been missed. Um, all those years. Here's another example of one. This is from Castle Dykes. Um, I think this is a, is a particularly good uh, striking image of one. Some of them have gaps across the gateway and some of them don't. And this is the camp at Book Castle um, near Calendar, which also has um, these rather remarkable ditch, ra rather remarkable entrances. Um, and here's a plan of it. So again, you can see these clavicular and oblique traverse, these stracathrotype gateways on the camp at Book Castle. In terms of what we get, 
the, the titulary is by far the most common um, form of gateway protection um, across Scotland, um, as you can see here. But we are, and the small number of claviculi, that's normally an upstanding example, Stracathro, where we've only got a gap, um, or unknown just means we don't have, don't have enough surviving of the camp really to be confident of, of the entrance way at all. But where we've just got a gap, it's possible that they had internal earthwork claviculi. So it's possible that those, so that the clavicular number would be bolstered, but we just don't know. And another feature before I leave, um, leave the form um, is annexes or attached camps. We only generally get these on camps, one particular series of camps, which are 63 acres in size. So they're quite large camps um, and we get them attached to what I think is the front entrance of the camp. So it's possibly got something in there that, um, that they didn't want to happen in the camp but um, they, we do think they're contemporary, although again, they've not been excavated and the possibility um, has been mooted that um, they're an advanced party, but in which case, why isn't it inside the camp? Or that there are a body left behind to guard the space um, after they've gone. We need more excavations to, uh, to be able to answer some of these questions. And then finally, we've got internal features. Now, I, I showed you obviously in Chituthal, we had some lines of features. I don't know how well you can see, but there are some lines of pits inside here. This is the site of, of uh, Dalgan Ross. And when I planned those and then converted it into, um, looked at the plan and then converted that into Roman feet, it was almost exactly what the classical authors were telling us would have been the length of two cohorts camped back to back. So we can start to think, use this to think about the density of occupation and that we've actually got the evidence for street lines here, which is rather exciting. Um, here's another one. This is Glen Locher um, in Dumfries and Galloway. Not so clear on the lines. There's a lot of activity going on in the camp, much more higgledy-piggledy. Kintour, to a certain extent, was more higgledy-piggledy. You can start to see some sort of lines, but it's not as clear. Um, we did some uh, we did some geophysical survey at Dal Swinton, also in Dumfries and Galloway, and we think each one of these sort of marks, these pop marks that you see on this, um, are possibly also the magnetic signals of ovens. Um, we've also got a whole range of them down the left hand, the, the sort of top um, left side of the camp as well, tucked into the back of the rampart, um, which is where we would expect to find a lot of ovens. So we're, we're quite confident that we've got an array of ovens um, inside this site as well. And then finally, this is one from um, on Hadrian's Wall, where the lines are really, really clear, marking inside from the entrance ways. Um, and this is really one of the clearest examples I've seen where you can really see the street layout uh, inside the camp. So that takes me on to their context and their dating. Well, the historical context has largely been set by the, um, the historical references that we have supplanted with archaeological evidence. So we know we've got the Romans in southern Scotland from the late 60s and early 70s. We've got dendrochronological dates, timber dates from the fort at Carlisle. And then we've got expansion into Scotland very shortly thereafter. We've got the governor of Britain, Agricola, um, dates are slightly disputed, but roughly AD 77 to 83. He was fortunate enough um, to be married to the daughter of the, um, or oh, sorry, his daughter uh, married the uh, the writer, Roman writer Tacitus, and Tacitus wrote a biography of his father. It's very much done in a style um, of his father-in-law, and that has survived. So it has tended to skew archaeological evidence with everyone assuming that something is Agricolan, but it is a wealth of material um, that actually tells us about um, some of the activities of, of Agricola in Northern Britain. We've got a battle named, unfound, the Battle of Mons Graupius, um, fought in the final season of, Agri of Agricola's campaigns in Scotland. We have the abandonment of conquests in Scotland, principally because of the requirement for troops being needed on the Danube. They pull back to ultimately to a line that's known as the Stane Gate between the Tyne and the Forth rivers, which then becomes the line of Hadrian's Wall when Hadrian comes into power and decides to build and decides to, to fossilise the empire at its extent and builds basically frontiers right round the empire. He encircles the empire and the most famous of those is Hadrian's Wall um, in Northern England. 
Shortly after um, his death, his successor, Antoninus Pius in AD 138, starts the reconquest of Scotland very shortly afterwards, and they build a second wall, this time of turf in Scotland, um, only 20 years or so after the construction or after construction started on Hadrian's Wall. But Scotland wasn't held. And there's a retreat south, south just a generation later. Um, again, back to the line of, of Hadrian's Wall, which is then rebuilt, which is one of the reasons why Hadrian's Wall survived so well, because it is, in effect, the frontier uh, for so many, so many years. We then have lots of tantalising evidence in the literature. We've got campaigns in the north by Ulpius Marcellus. There's nothing we can hand on heart say is definitely him. Buy-offs of local tribes. We do have coin hoards in various areas um, that actually are probably part indicative of part of this. We've got the reconquest by the Emperor Septimius Severus, who based himself in York and physically came to Scotland and campaigned in Scotland. And then we've got campaigns against the Picts, trouble with the Picts, Pictish wars um, at various points in the fourth century. This actually means with regards to camps, as I say, they're only occupied for a short period. These are troops that are moving through the landscape. So how we date them is quite tricky. Not that many of them have been excavated. So we've got historical context. So it's dates, gi dates given on basis of probability because of where they're located. They're next to a site which we have dated. More often than not, that's a fort. Sometimes it's a road. There may have been ground survey and excavation, which may have given a sequence when you've got multiple sites that overlap. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of those. And then we've got um, where we're really lucky, radiocarbon dates and stratified artifacts. But that's not the common, uh, the common way that we do it, unfortunately. Now, Kenneth and Joseph, as I say, did an awful lot of work on Roman Scotland and he grouped them. He grouped them into different um, based differences based on their size and a lot of his groups have actually stood up to later scrutiny. Um, we would tweak them, uh, we have tweaked them now slightly, but in essence what he's saying here has largely stood the test of time. Um, I'll keep going with, with acres, but I can give them in hectares um, or I may end up giving them in both because I'm kind of in, in that habit now. Um, but uh, and, and another element which actually we can help to date to the first century is this particular type of gate type. This type of clavicular gate is first recorded um, sort of in the in the second century BC. We've got them in parts of the Roman Empire uh, long before the Romans came to Britain. But the latest that we've got one that's confidently dated is probably the wars of Hadrian in um, in Syria or in, in, um, in Israel in 132 AD. So we don't have anything that's Antonine or later, which is what you would see in Scotland. So in, in a Scottish context, when we have sites with this particular type of gateway, we usually assume that they're first century in date. They belong to these campaigns in the first century, Agricola and his predecessor and successors. The camp at Kintore, I mentioned, it's 110 acres in size, 44 hectares. There are three other camps Nearby, there's four of them in a sequence and other ones that are um, have tantalizing similarities. We've got Norman Dykes, the same size as Kintore, a day's march to the south. Um, the camp of Ith and Wells, um, more than a day's march to the north. There's a much larger camp in the middle at Logie Derno, which is generally grouped with these. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. And then a day's march north of that, we have Murifold. Because Kintore, um, we're quite confident in its date of being in the first century, that takes these other um, sites with us. So we can sit there and say, well, actually, we're relatively confident that these camps belong to these Flavian campaigns. So Flavian is the names of the emperors. So these campaigns in the first century. We've got places like, this is Castle Dykes, as I mentioned near Lanark, where we've got, um, again, we've got these gates. We've got a sequence of things. The fort has occupation in the first century Flavian period and the second century Antonine period. We've got sequences between the camps. We think the camps on the left here are probably first century in date um, and the ones on the right are probably later. What that actually then gives us is a picture that looks a bit like this. Now, these are the camps that we say we think are Flavian. We think these are first century. There are going to be a lot of other camps that are first century, but we just can't be confident enough to say we think they're first century. 
And when I put the forts onto this map, you will then see in the forts of the squares that have uh, the purple squares that have just come on, you will see that actually just how many gaps we've got uh, where we must have more first century camps and we're just not seeing them. We've also got um, the outer limes, they're sometimes called um, Glen blockers, but basically they're, they're beyond the, the Gask Ridge first century forts. We've got forts and camps. This is Malling on the Lake of Menteith, where we've got a first century fort, and we've got camps on either side of it, which both have these clavicular stracathro gateways. Um, so again, we think that both camps and the fort here are first century in date. Bocassel, um, obviously just outside Calendar, has a fort which has been excavated and dated to the first century um, in date from the small scale excavations that have taken place, plus the more recent geophysical work by the Roman Gask project. And then, as I mentioned, the camp outside it with these Tricathro dates. So again, we think we have sites that are occupied, um, the camp and the fort um, in the first century. Um, and then again, that's the picture of the gateway I showed earlier. Um, and this has brought a picture. This is um, the Roman gas interpretation of the first century in the area. So you've got the these outer limes forts, and then you've got the Roman line itself, the, the fortified road with the watchtowers running along the Gask, and then up into Perthshire. So this again is give you an idea of, of the, the level of, of the intensity of the occupation uh, of the army in the first century with all these towers and forts. And I'm not going to leave the first century before mentioning Mons Graupius. Um, still unknown, there have been some interesting developments on, uh, for, on continental battlefields over the last um, sort of 30 years where metal detecting has actually uncovered battlefield sites. More often than not, these are battles that, um, that the Romans lost that we seem to have found through metal detecting rather than this one, which allegedly they won. The extent to which it was a massive battle rather than an overblown skirmish, we don't know, but I don't think Tacitus would have been able to completely invent something in living memory of people um, at the time. And so here is a selection of places that have been attributed. Uh, this is from Gordon Maxwell's book on the subject. And one of the favoured sites is, um, is Benahi up in Aberdeenshire. It's um, St. Joseph suggested it, that that large camp of Logie Derno that I mentioned, which is the largest in northeast Scotland, um, lies at the foot and potentially uh, where you would see, uh, see the battlefield site. So that's probably the best, um, the favourite of the moment, but that's not to say that any of the others um, aren't, uh, aren't the site. They've all got, uh, they've all got their merits. But moving to the second century, obviously the most obvious uh, remainder that we have there are the, is, the, is the Antonine Wall. And here we've got the Fort of Rough Castle and then the Linear Barrier, the Ditch and the Rampart and the Upcast Mound. I've mentioned the camps. As I say, a couple of them have been excavated. They've produced second century dating material. So we're quite confident that these are Antonine in date. Um, down at Kirkpatrick Fleming, not far across the border from Carlisle, um, we've got a 63 acre camp, which has got a little attached annex. Excavations on this produced Hadrianic pottery, which, or late Hadrianic pottery, which in a Scottish context, we'd probably say that's probably early Antonine. It's probably just been in use for a number of years. Um, so we've actually possibly got um, some Antonine dating here. This is the Fort of Line in the Scottish borders. Interestingly, we have forts on either side of the Line water. We've got a second century fort on the north side and a first century Flavian fort on the south side. Both camps are on the north side, so they're on the same side as the Antonine Fort. And excavations on Camp 2 here produced Antonine pottery. So again, we're saying well, we've got an Antonine camp. And interestingly, it does look as if perhaps the Flavian, the first century, activity is possibly on the south side of the river. So potentially both the camps on the north side might be Antonine, but we can be relatively confident on one of them. Dunning in Perthshire, again on the Gask Ridge, um, housing this housing development over the western entranceway um, on the left-hand side produced pottery of a second century date, 
but the camp, which is 110 acres in size, is a day's march from a camp at Abernethy, which produced first century material. But you might be able to see an additional mark down the east side, the right hand side. So it's possible that this camp was used more than once. So that then complicates the picture even further if we're saying this was used in the first century and the second century. This is um, an aerial view of, of the large camp at, uh, at Abernethy. This is um, at Beetook. Um, down so not far from Moffat and this is the Evan water and you will see all these um, channels and you can see the Evan water has moved around this um, this particular um, gravel terrace a huge amount and paleo environmental work looking at the paleo channels demonstrated that on the north side of the river that actual um, terrace wasn't formed um, in the first century it wasn't formed till the second century so we can be relatively confident when we look at that because there's quite a number of sites that the camp on the south of the river with these um, stracatho type gateways is first century in date and those in on the north side of the river are second century or later, but probably second century in this context. A day's march to the north of that, we have the site of Crawford with two camps here. So we're saying, well, actually, the day's march, are these also Antonine? No dating evidence beyond that. So I hope it gives you an idea of really the clutching at straws and, and, and what we do to actually try and, and put dates onto these things. This is in a Pephry in Perthshire where the Roman gas projects took, stuck a trench through the intersection between this 63 acre camp and the Roman road and they actually demonstrated that the road was later than the camp. The camp was always thought to be later than the road. They thought the road was first or second century in date and the camp was third century. Well if the camp's earlier than the road, the latest that the road is is second century in date, it's possible that we've got really early Antonine camps from that very first initial um, phase of Antonine conquest into Scotland before um, they actually then put the outer, outer forts on uh, for the Antonine wall. So it's possible that actually we've got a whole series of camps here which have traditionally been thought of as third century in date belonging to the Emperor Septimius Severus that are actually Antonine in date. And one of these 63 acre camps is just outside the well-known fort of Ardoch, which is down here um, at Braco. And it um, it's overlaps a whole other series of camps. And the largest one here, Camp 1, I'll come back to, but that is the latest feature on the site um, from looking at the earthwork um, and crop mark remains. So if that site at um, Ardoch and Inapefri West, if they are second century in date, they are part of what looks like, these are all roughly a day's march apart, potentially an out and back route of an army, which was always traditionally thought to be third century in date, but is potentially now second century in date. So that actually is then starting to give us a, a flavour and a character of the army um, up in this part of the world in the second century. So this traditionally is second century dating, again, very sparse like that first century map was. But if we add on those other camps, um, then you're actually starting to, to have a much fuller picture of potentially what the army was doing and where it was patrolling and where it was going when it first did that conquest of Scotland and indeed in the consolidation and holding of the Antonine frontier. Third century. Um, we've got the fortress of Carpu um, on the south side of the Tay. Um, we've got, as I mentioned, this large camp. We've got um, this largest camp here. It's 130 acres in size. It's part of a series of camps that we've got on a similar route to the 63 acre camps, which is why they've always been grouped together. It overlies a first century watchtower. It overlies the annex to the fort. The annex is either first or second century. The fort was occupied in both. We don't know about the annex, but it's generally thought that armies, an army of this scale is possibly to do with these large campaigns um, that the Emperor Septimius Severus put up in the third century. Um, and these are the overlapping camps at, uh, at Ardoch. And there have been one or two excavations looking at the sequencing in them, which as I say is why we know that's the latest feature on site. Now I mentioned our dock is one of a series of camps and these are potentially long days march apart but these are coming up through um, Scotland up to the one at Care House, um, North um, Balmacoon and Care House are north of the Montrose Basin 
And we are told by the classical authors that Septimius Severus reached the end of Scotland. Well, this most certainly is not the end of Scotland, but of course he did get within decent sight. It's, it's good high ground with good views of the sea. So depending on how you're interpreting it, they got to the coast. It wasn't Northern Scotland, um, but it's possible, um, as I say, these seem quite likely to be um, third century in date. Interestingly, there's this outlier, which some of you may have spotted at Wooden Home Farm. And this then leads us on to another group of camps, um, which we get down in southern Scotland, which are larger still, because I said those are 130 acres. We've got a group of four camps, which are 165 to 170 acres in size, um, which, you know, you need about 16 photographs to actually show them. These are huge. Um, this is St Leonard's in the Scottish borders. And that's a plan of it to give you an idea of its scale. And um, also one at Newstead, um, the fort of, outside the fort of Tramontium in the Scottish borders near Melrose. And there's the fort. And this huge camp here with, um, with the Roman numeral five, the V in the middle of it. This is another one, these 165 acre camps. This again is a late feature we know from the excavations that, that have taken place. And the most likely context for a camp of this scale is if you've actually got the emperor traveling with his Praetorian Guard, all the administrators that he would have need to run the empire from basically what we now see as fields in the Scottish borders, that's a massive army, it's a massive number of people, it's a massive amount of space and that is the best explanation plus these are the latest features on site. So these are these four big ones here, Pathhead, Channel Kirk, St Leonard's and Newstead. And that other one that I mentioned may have been bringing in an army to meet them um, that may have met an army coming up the Tweed because Newstead is a convenient meeting point for the Tweed and the Roman road of Deer Street that runs up um, along the line of the modern A68. So that's, um, that's certainly the theory um, at the moment for, for those sites. So in terms of context, I'm conscious of time, and, and, uh, um, but that's given you a run through. There are no camps that we can comfortably date um, to the later periods, but some of them must date to that. But I'm also acutely aware that I've shown you lots and lots of pictures of empty fields. So I like to finish with um, images that actually of what these things may have looked like. This is actually a blink and you miss it screen grab from the movie Gladiator. Uh, which I still think is by far the best uh, depiction of the Roman army in a fortified camp um, that I've ever seen Hollywood produce. Um, it's really quite fantastic because it also gives you an indication of just how dirty um, and potentially unpleasant that these things may have been. And in terms of an army on the march, I was fortunate enough to go to an exhibition um, of miniature soldiers um, a few years ago, and they'd put together what soldiers on the march may have looked like, um, and again, what a camp may have looked like. Um, if anyone is interested in, in hearing more, as um, Ross said, I've, I've written a couple of books. The one on the left is now um, unfortunately out of print, but we're hoping to try and make it available as a digital monograph, um, hopefully relatively soon through the Society of Antichrist of Scotland. But otherwise, it's thank you for listening. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was a, a really wonderful and comprehensive um, talk for us. And we've got lots of questions coming through throughout. So I think we'll just get jump right into that, if that's OK with you. I'll give you a little bit of a pause for a drink. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of initial questions focused around about surveys and LIDAR and, and things like that. So um, from Ailsa, we have why has there not been more work to identify the Roman roads linking the camps north of the Antonine Wall? Um, and could LIDAR be used to identify these routes? Um, I think the reason why there's not been more work is because um, the Roman army hasn't been a dominant topic for, um, for archaeological survey since really the 60s and 70s. Um, it it had, um, had a lot more interest then. There has been a student at Edinburgh University doing Roman roads, and I'm, I'm waiting to see what... Um, what he produced, produces, because that would be interesting. But absolutely, I think LIDAR is definitely one of the ways forward forward for us. And interestingly, it's a lot of times things are found uh, serendipitously and it's um, somebody might be doing a, 
a development of some sort where they come across something that and they, they trip over something that may be part of a Roman road or it may be part of a Roman camp or something like that. And certainly the, the camps that have been found most recently in Scotland, um, the two, two that have been found most recently have been found as a result of, um, of building works of, of excavation, one of which was the Aberdeen Western Periphery Bypass um, that uncovered a new camp. And also um, I think it was a, uh, a Tesco's in air also uncovered one. So it's interesting what, um, you know, how, we, how we're finding them, but, but LIDAR is definitely, um, a, a provides us with lots of opportunities. For those of you that are, um, is everyone aware of, of LIDAR? It's basically airborne laser scanning of the ground and it has the opportunity to, um, to actually give us really good high quality metrical accuracy um, of sort of small humps and bumps in the earth and it can often show us things that you couldn't see with the naked eye or you can't see conventionally with a, a camera sticking out of a plane. And related to this, um, is it likely that you'll be able to find camps in forested areas from aerial surveys or do you have to rely on other methods for that? Um, well with LIDAR um, you can do in deciduous woodland. It, it, it depends on the, on the woods because it relies on, it needs to be able to see through the trees to hit the ground. So it really depends on the on the woodland. But I've seen some, when, when LIDAR first started to be used, I was seeing some fantastic ones where people would say, and this is what it looks like with a tree cover and I can digitally remove the trees and they would show you these features. So it depends on the, on the nature of, of the woodland um, and, um, and the plantation and the, and the density of the plantation. Um, but it certainly is possible uh, to sometimes see things. With regards to the air, I mean those those camps that I showed you where you could see them surviving in woodland, uh, you can see the crop marks of those in the fields beyond the wood, but flying over them you can't see them. But because those things survive as earthworks in the woodland, they can be they can be seen quite well. And do we have any idea for of how long each type of camp was occupied and, and indeed how long it would have taken to build one of the camps? In terms of building, I think quite quick. Um, the Roman army was quite used to, to throwing these things up and actually um, some of the camps, um, there's one of the camps in Stirlingshire that um, St Joseph stuck about 20 trenches around its perimeter and the difference between, there's no rampart surviving unfortunately, but the difference between the ditch on one side to the other can't be always fully explained away by um, the survival nature of, of the, um, and the, the sort of use of the landscape subsequently the farming regimes and things and it's possible that because as I say the, the focus if the focus is on um, the rampart but you do put a ditch outside particularly if you're in in how the Romans would regard it as hostile territory um, that you've actually got differences in ditches um, from either side so that's possibly um, one facet of that sorry that was a two-pronged question and I've now forgotten what the other part of it was. It's, it's round about reuse. Uh, do you know how long they're maybe occupied? Oh, how long they're occupied for? We don't know. Um, they, I mean, traditionally, they were always thought to be not occupied overnight, but that's an awful lot of effort to put in for something you're going to dismantle the following day. What we do have is um, a couple of the sites where you've got ovens, both at Kintor and um, and the site up in um, up on the Aberdeen Bypass. We've got um, we've got evidence for multiple firings. And that's between four and six firings of some of these ovens. And we don't know whether they were firing daily or weekly, but if they're firing weekly, then I'd say six weeks. So I'd say anywhere between a week and six weeks is what the evidence is showing us. But, you know, we, we, we don't know. And, and the, the classical authors don't give us that level of, of, um, of preciseness, really. This is quite a, an interesting question from Stephen. Um, he says that it's fascinating, but it all seems a bit over the top. Uh, was it proportionate to the threat? Ooh, um, I, I think um, I think you'll find lots of disagreement on the scale of the threat. Um, but actually, I think there's an I'm going to complete the job mentality. And certainly in the first century, um, the intention was the conquest of Britain without shadow of a doubt. They intended to complete it um, because Britain invariably for most of its occupation. So, you know, we're talking four centuries of Roman rule had between three and four legions stationed here. Spain, which also took them a couple of hundred years to, to conquer, but uh, BC rather than AD, had one legion in it. Most of the Roman sites, um, you know, one legion was enough to control the whole of the Iberian Peninsula. So that's Spain and Portugal. 
and yet Britain had three to four. We were expensive. This was an expensive place to occupy. So the logical thing is to conquer the whole thing and leave one legion here with the auxiliary, the other regiments of the army that you would have needed round it. Um, and that's not what, what happened. And I don't doubt also that in the third century, Septimius Severus had exactly the same ambitions to finish conquering um, the whole of uh, the whole of of Scotland and the whole of Britain in effect. And indeed, actually in the first century, we're told that Agricola gazed across at, um, at Ireland and probably and said, oh, it'll only take a legion to, contact, you know, to conquer that. Well, um, one would argue that later history probably suggests that a legion may have not been sufficient as well in the same way that um, three legions wasn't sufficient for um, really to, to, to finish, finish off Britain. So I think had they actually succeeded in conquering Britain and had Britain then been Romanized in the way the other provinces were, then it may well have been. But whether the whole of Britain was ever really economically viable, um, I would argue probably not. Um, and I'm not alone in that. I mean, obviously there are, there are various bits of supplies. There are things that, that Britain supplied to, uh, supply to Rome, but so did other countries in, in, in some instances in a lot more for a lot less money, a lot less investment. But you don't want to be the emperor that, that, that loses Britain. <laughs> um, so a little bit of local interest here. Um, so Paul asks that you, you gave the abandonment of conquest in Scotland as AD 90s, um, but he'd read that the fort at Bowcastle was abandoned between 80 and 85 AD. So is that a significant difference? Um, there's a pulling back. We've got dates of around about 86. The reason I do 90s is because of the it's a gradual pulling back. So it's definitely in the 80s from, from this part of, of Scotland. But by the time you get, sorry, this part as in Calendar, Bocastle, by the time you get into southern Scotland, it's later. It's a, it's a, it's a gradual withdrawal back. Um, so no, we, we would have sort of 84 to 86 potentially as, as the withdrawal from um, from the, the, those sort of northern northern campaigns, so yes, that that's um, that that is true. And the reason I've got the nineties is because some of the forts in southern Scotland were held um, that bit later. And um, from Olga, um, what sort of artifacts have been found inside the camps? Um, very few, um, sadly, um, because. Unlike forts, as I say, where, where the, the army's there for a prolonged period of time, they've got pottery, they're breaking things, they're leaving things behind, um, burying, burying nails, as we know in the case of Inchtuthal. Um, they're probably, they've probably got more metal um, stuff that they're carrying with them. They've got less breakables um, and they're taking it with them because they need it to the next place. What we do have, as I say, at places like Kintor, which have been excavated, is we've got in the remnants in the ovens is you've got um, bits and pieces of stuff that they've thrown away or that they've burnt. I think in one instance they've got a hinge. Now it's possible or it's quite likely that that's the hinge on a wooden thing and the wooden thing has it's broken in some way and the wooden thing's been burnt and so we've got a burnt hinge um, surviving. So there's odds, odds and ends that I mean there's always odd bits of pottery and things like that. There's allegedly a couple of bits of, of glass in, in various things. We've often got uh, the site in, um, in fact, both the, the more recent excavations, both at Air and um, on the Aberdeen bypass, we've had radiocarbon dates from the ovens, which have, which have given us um, quite confident dating. Um, so you've got cereal grains potentially and, and charcoal and, and things like that. But we don't get a huge amount of material culture from camps, unfortunately. As I say, it's partly because the army is there for a short period of time. They're not leaving the scale of rubbish. I mean, I, before now, I've sort of said, you know, if you imagine, you know, a big campsite for tea in the park or Glastonbury or something like that, and you look at the images after all the tents have gone and it's rubbish strewn, well, you might have rubbish pits and things, but you haven't got the disposable culture that we have today. Um, and so the pits um, at the camp at Inch Toothill had um, some animal bones in them. So these are probably things that have been eaten and thrown away. So we haven't got massive amounts of evidence, very occasionally coins, if you're really lucky, but they're stray finds, not necessarily found in excavations. Great. And uh, we have another recommendation from 
Patrick to watch the Netflix series Barbarians, so uh, that might that might surpass Gladiator possibly. <laughs> I know uh, I don't have Netflix. I must what, try and find it, get it to watch it at some point. <laughs> uh, so I think this is a, a nice one to end on. But from an an anonymous attendee, what Roman site or sites in Scotland would you most like to see excavated or otherwise further examined in the near future? Oh, gosh. To be honest, um, I think any camp which indicates that it's got internal features, so do geophysics first or look at the aerial record to be confident you've got um, interior features. Um, and if anyone could actually dig the whole thing, that would be really exciting. You'd have to obviously get scheduled monument consent if it's a, if it's a protected site. But I think it would be really um really exciting and uh, you know uh, that would that could be any site but we are I mean I've told you the size of some of these things I mean I think the idea of digging um, 170 acres is totally unrealistic um, but you know pick a smaller one that's got internal features and and um, I mean you wouldn't need to dig the whole thing but do um, select features of it I think would be really exciting and and so really any any site will tell us an awful lot more than we know at the moment. That's great. Well, I, th I think we better leave it there because um, we could probably go on all night. But thank you, everyone, for all their great questions and lots of lovely comments as well for, for just how much they enjoyed your talk, Rebecca. So that's always nice to see. Uh, thank so you thank much. you again on, on behalf of myself and everyone involved in Camders Landscape. That was a really fantastic talk. Um, and just before we, we kind of close the meeting, just to flag up uh, that our lecture series does continue. Um, we have another lecture on the 9th of February. Uh, which is focused on Gaelic in historic Perthshire. And that's been, uh, Aileen Ogilvy is going to be speaking to us about that from Perth and Kinross Council. So we're looking forward to that one and do sign up on our website if you're interested. But thank you again, everyone else for coming along. And thanks again to Rebecca for a fantastic talk. And we'll see you all soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.